So let's review from last time. So you remember last time we spoke about return. We said you can't return to where you never were. I can't return to China. We said that the soul comes from a place of exaltation, and that before you were born you knew everything. But we forget everything. So what life is about is a subconscious battle to retain our sense of morality. So the idea of having an inner sense of morality we illustrated yesterday, last time by saying if you saw someone cut off someone's braid on the bus, you say, what are you doing? It could whatever. And if, so where does it say you can't do that? That's not good enough. We then spoke through the seven mitzvot that are universal, to Jews and non-Jews as well. We said that these universal mitzvot have to do with what today we would call conscience. We then said that the flow between who you are, your identity, and this higher knowledge could be blocked. Our topic today is what blocks it. Okay, clear? Any questions on the old stuff before we start the new stuff? Okay. So I'm going to use a word that's extremely unpopular and totally politically incorrect. You ready? Sin. Sin! You sinner! Okay, whatever. So sin is a, is a very unpopular word because the implication of sin is that there is such a thing as objective morality, which currently isn't in vogue. Okay? So there is such a thing as moral error. The word error implies mistake, like, <gasps> and one sort of sin could be called error. So I want to explain to you what that is. The word for that in Hebrew is chet, which literally means missing the mark. So it means is that your intentions may have been good, but the outcome was not. So I want to give you an example of this, and then we'll talk about why it would block you as opposed to affecting the world. You all drive? Anybody here doesn't drive? Okay. Um, how many of you who drive, you all drive, how many of you could honestly say you always obey traffic laws and would never dream of disobeying a traffic law? Okay. With that in mind, okay, are any of you into law, any of you studying law? That's good because right now law is a field that's completely, completely overflowing in America and it's very hard to get a good job. Okay, so suppose you are studying law, and suppose you like law, and suppose you're studying in a really first-class university. I would say in law, probably NYU is the best possible place you could study. That's just a subjective opinion, okay? And you graduated, and you did well, and it's six months later, and you still don't have a job. Could such things happen? Okay. So you finally get an interview with a good firm, like a really good firm, let's say like Strook Strook, a really good firm. They want you there at 9 in the morning. What time are you going to get up? You'd get up at 7, 6, 7. You'd all, what's your morning plan? Let's say it take, you live in Brooklyn, let's say. Oh, no, not that. Okay. You live in Brooklyn, it takes an hour to get to Manhattan, where the law office is. You'd get up 6, 7, right? What would your plan be? What would you do between 6 when you get up and 9 when you have to be standing in front of Mr. McGuire? What's the plan? No. What? You'll get there 10 minutes early, but what will you do at 6? Shower, breakfast. Okay. Brush your teeth. Look in the mirror. Adjust your makeup. Yeah, you could see this. Then finally you get on the train and you're off and you get there 10 minutes early. That's how it should be. Suppose your alarm clock didn't ring. So you got up by yourself at 10 to 8. Now in this kind of interview, calling up and saying, I'm going to be delayed, you may as well not come at all. There's no reason to come if you're going to be delayed. What are your options now? It's 10 to 8. OK, so you have to rush. OK, so you throw on your clothes. Get in your car, you're going to drive to Manhattan, which is faster than going by train. You'll pay $25 an hour for a parking space, and that's fine. Okay, right, you can picture yourself doing this. Okay, now you've already admitted that you don't always keep all of the, the traffic laws, right? Could you picture stretching things a little on your way to Manhattan? Okay, so let's say you, in the accident, you only killed one person and permanently injured three. Have such things happened? Okay, that's called hate. When you left, all you wanted to do was to get to a job interview. But the results were not good. How many of you would say the person who did this, if it was you in this case, how many of you would say there's a dimension of accountability here? 
Okay, let's see. Okay, why is there accountability? Put it into words. Because you're the one behind the wheel. Okay, because you're the one behind the wheel. You'd all agree, yeah? Because you could have not done that and then taken, like, put your own life at risk, but not get it. Right. You could have chosen to just not call up and say, I'm sorry, I can't come, because you can't safely come at that time. You could have made that choice. Now, suppose it was really not your fault. You leave, you're leaving at 10 to 8, and you're keeping every single traffic law. Like you're driving impeccably, and a car rams into you, and people are killed. Would you still feel that you're accountable? Even though you're behind the wheel, right? Okay, good. So I want to introduce you to the Hebrew words for both of these situations. The second one, where you really were doing everything right, but there was a bad outcome, is called onus. A person is not liable for onus. It's not considered to be their fault. They're not held accountable. It's not a spiritual blockage to their higher self. But I'm going to throw in a but. Let's say that was you. Would you feel okay about it? No. So even though you're not liable in any sense, not morally, not practically, it should speak to you. And if you don't let it speak to you, there's something wrong. Did you see where this is so? Okay, moving on. So that's called chet. Chet is where you made a choice through negligence and you're accountable for it. Now, what does that say? You had it right. You said, what was the choice? Say it again. Say what your choice was. You could have... Oh, you could have just not cared that much about your own. Right. So that has to do with your system of values. Chet has to do with your system of values. Okay, this is why there's a dimension of accountability. Okay, there's a whole other kind of blockage. Another kind of blockage is called avon, which means desire. Okay, how many of you have ever seen bad French movies? <laughs> Jean Pierre loves Marcel, but Marcel loves Paul. Paul, in the meantime, loves Diana. Okay, and by like 15 minutes into the movie, wait a minute. <laughs> It's like a chess game, yeah? Okay, in real life, in French movies, everybody is happy at the end. In real life, do people destroy each other's lives through lust? Yeah. All the time. So I want you to be aware, in America, there's an entire new documented class of poverty. Did you know this? Women in their 40s who've been divorced by men because they fall in love with younger women and lust with younger women and leave the women basically without support. Okay, clear? So this is a whole new class of impoverished person. Okay. Now, you have two people. You have Jean-Paul, who left Marie because he met, okay, whatever. Okay, and she's destitute. Let's say she commits suicide. Let's say she doesn't. Either way. Okay, yeah? Is he more or less accountable than the person who drove to work too fast? What would you say? More accountable or less accountable? It depends. You're right. That's the Judaic answer. It depends. It depends. It depends on where he was at. It depends on whether he had some acknowledgement of what was going on. It depends on how strong the forces of desire is. Who could make that judgment? God. Not us. Okay, clear? But is there a blockage he created? For sure, because he said, my desires are more important than what? Somebody else's life. So... Last thing, last category. The last category is called Pesha. Pesha literally means rebellion. Do you remember being 15? You're still, like, how old are you? Yeah, you remember 15? No, you blocked it out. How many of you were terrible teenagers? Only me in this whole room, the rest of you were good. Uh, relate, relate, okay. <laughs> So if you're a terrible teenager and it's cold outside, <sighs> snow, okay, and you're about to leave and your mom says, wear your coat. What did I buy you the coat for? It costs so much money. I told you you didn't need another coat. No, but you have to have the coat. Okay, what's going to happen next if you're 15? I'm not wearing a coat. No matter how cold it is, you are not going to wear that coat. You could see this. Like, you know, you can go out and be like, any of you from Ottawa? 
Okay. In other words, if you're wet, you go out, you're in permafreeze, and you're like, it's bad. Okay, so um, no matter how cold it is, you go out without a coat. Okay, now be your own age. How old are you? 29. It's very cold out. It's windy. There's snow. Your mom says, wear your coat. What do you say? You go to the closet, put it on, and leave, okay? You might even be courteous and say, oh, thanks. Okay, right? So what's the difference in mentality between the 15-year-old and the 29-year-old? Logic. Hmm? Logic. But I also want to tell you something more. The 15-year-old feels that if she gives in to her mother, she's losing herself. So when the mother says wear a coat, it's not to her, it's not about the coat, it's about her presence of a person, about her freedom, about her integrity as a human. When you're 29, it's about a coat. Okay, clear? So I have a friend who had the great pleasure of teaching for a while in an inner city middle school. Could you see where that could be a great pleasure? An unforgettable pleasure, okay, whatever. And she's good at, she's good at what she does, the kids liked her. So she's small. She's small and she looks Jewish. Like she, you know, the whole works. So she came into school one day. Remember, the kids like her. Otherwise, she couldn't survive in that environment. Okay. And she saw one of the boys wearing his shirt inside out. Now, she didn't know that that was supposed to be cool. So she went over to him and said, Okay. What happened next was the only time during her entire career that she really felt she might be in danger. He said, you shut your mouth, you fat. That was all about Jews. Before I, OK, got this. Because your mother is a, you have the picture? And there's a crowd around. OK, now she got out of it. Now suppose I came with my shirt inside out. And somebody would say, what would happen next? Go to the bathroom. Thank you. Go to the bathroom. Change my shirt. So again, it's because for Eddie, it was about him. And for me, it's about a shirt. Got it? So a pesha is a sin that you do when you're doing the wrong thing because you feel, on an emotional level, endangered. So I want to take you through my own mini research on this. I had a lot of mistaken ideas about murder. So I'll ask you this. How many murders by gunshot do you think take place in America on the average day? What do you think the average number is? 50. You said 50. You said 100. Yeah. What? Said 20 you say 20 an hour? <laughs> OK, by gunshot. Remember, I'm excluding everything else. Yeah, we're taking those. OK, so I don't know anymore, but I do know in 1986, it was only, to me, this was only, it was 76 per day. OK? So I thought it was thousands. <laughs> I come from Brooklyn. Wow, it's a miracle anyone's alive. But, but it was 76 per day, which when you consider the size of America is not that much. Now, another thing that I was wrong, and I was wrong in everything I thought, all my cliché is thinking was wrong. I assumed that all of these murders were about drugs and gangs. What are they really about? A small percentage is drugs and gangs. What are they mostly? Domestic. They're domestic, okay, clear? There's an awful lot of, and I saw her in bed with text, I blew them both away. There was a lot of that, okay? The last thing I thought that turned out not to be true was that once people are apprehended, tried, and imprisoned, they would have terrible regret for what they did. Do you think that was true? I would have, I would have sworn on it, because they ruined their lives. No, they come back and I do the same thing again tomorrow. He, okay, got this. All right, so why am I telling you this? So the reason I'm telling you this is that a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of bad stuff that happened comes because people feel emotionally threatened rather than actually threatened. Okay, and they get themselves in terrible trouble and are in sin. They're blocked. Their higher self is blocked. So this was all bad news, right? Mm -hmm.